Chapter two, the schooners were full to the gunwales with a winter's worth of pelts for trading. Everything we needed for the trip had been packed from our tents. The men used long poles to pry the boats free of the shore where they were stored for the winter and a system of pulleys to pull them back into the water. Planks were laid down to bridge the gap between the shore and the schooners, and we all climbed aboard and prepared for our spring migration. We traveled with six other schooners, each carrying as many as six or seven families. Our schooner was the North Star. It was owned by Mr. Carpenter and Mr. Wolke, but had once been part of the famous Stephenson's Expedition, Expedition's fleet. We stayed aboard the ship for the entire five-day journey. Five days may not seem like much, but to me, it might as well have been a year. From the first day, I searched for signs that we were nearing the mainland. The voyage across the ocean was fraught with anticipation, and when we finally reached Tatoyatuk, I felt both happiness that we had made it that far and sadness that we still had a long way to go. Beyond Tuktoyatuk, the pingos rose out of the ocean like goose eggs with smashed in tops. We passed them and entered the mouth of the Mackenzie River. The Richardson Mountains cut into the horizon, far off to the southwest, and small, sparse trees lined the shores. We came to Reindeer Station, a settlement of herders, and excitement consumed me. We would soon be heading up the Peel River, and the last leg of our journey. Sometime after lunch on the final day of the noise, the noise of children playing reached our ears and we could see spiraling towers of smoke rising high into the sky from many campfires. A dozen boats as large as whales were tethered to the bank. We had made it. We had reached a clavic. After our schooner was secured and a large board was laid over the side of the North Star, we children were given permission to go and seek out our friends and cousins who had also arise, arrived to sell their pelts and stock up on supplies for the year. We made our way down the plank and scrambled up the steep, muddy slope to the settlement of our own great-grandfather. Old man Pakoyuk had found it as a trading post. Later that day, after my father had sold his winter's catch of furs, my mother came to find me. I was giddy with excitement, knowing what was to come. I tossed the caribou hide ball I was playing with high into the air, leaving a cluster of children scrambling for it. I followed my mother to the Hudson's Bay Company. The Hudson's Bay Company was a magical place. They sold everything a person could ever need, from furniture to ladies' dresses, from rifles to candy. My mother stopped me on the stairs before I could race into the small treasure-packed timber building. She took one of my long braids in her hand. You know, the nuns will cut your hair. Are you sure you want to? You still want to attend the school? Yes, I told her and tried to make my face very serious. They will make you work hard, harder than you do when you help your father. I am strong, I said, pushing my shoulders back. They will not be kind to you. They are not your family, and they are not like us. I will have Agnes. I will be fine. You will see. My mother sure seemed to know a lot about a place she had never been. I figured she was trying to scare me. Life would be more difficult without me there to help her with the smaller children, and she was likely jealous of my opportunity to learn to read. Well, then... We had better go and find you some new stockings to keep your legs warm underneath your uniform. My mother bought me some strange smelling soap, a comb to keep my hair neat, a brush for my teeth, and something in a white tube. She also bought me a thick, heavy pair of gray stockings. They were like the kind I had seen the outsiders wear, the kind that pull up above your knees. I wanted to put them on right away, but my mother told me I had to wait. I would not want to soil them before school because the outsiders loved cleanliness. As we left the store, I noticed a member of the RCMP relaxing on a chair near the entrance. The mountainee was reading 
The Mountie was reading from one of the ma many richly colored books that crammed a tall column of shelves beside him. How distinguished he looked as he pulled at a pipe and a book in his hand. Soon I, too, would be able to read. My parents did not let me go to school right away. They wanted to keep me until after the athletic games, which were held on Dominion Day, the 1st of July, three whole days after our arrival. July was a festive time of year for the Inuit, including us Inuvialuit and the D Dini Nation, made up of native peoples such as the Gwich'in. Freed at last from the ice, the men would bring their families to a clavic, not only for supplies, but also to compete against each other in tests of strength. I was disappointed that I could not go to school immediately, but I did not often get to see my cousins and enjoyed visiting with them. On the first day of the games, my father made a balloon for us by blowing up the sack from the throat of a tar tarmigan. We chased each other we chased each other down a long, seemingly endless street. The sound of our feet clomping and thudding against the wooden boardwalk, batting the balloon into the air and stealing it from one another. I caught it and ran. Soon, I could no longer hear my sisters and cousins behind me. I had lost them. I looked up and stopped, forgetting the balloon. In front of me, at least a dozen children dressed in uniforms crouched in a silty garden, breaking the earth and pulling at roots with small tools. These had to be the naughty children who were made to kneel for forgiveness. Behind them stood two immense wooden buildings, so much larger than our schooner, with rows and rows of windows. I had forgotten how big these buildings were. This was where I would go to school, but I would not be like these children. I would be good and spend all of my time inside learning to read. I batted the balloon from one hand to the other and turned and ran back to find my cousins and my sisters. The day after the athletic games began, a boat docked. We watched its passengers file up the beach. They, they were children with solemn faces, some of them crying. I searched the faces for Agnes, but she was not among them. See those children, my mother said to me. They will be your classmates. Why are they crying, I asked. Because they do not want to go to the outsider school. Don't they know they're going to learn to read? They would rather be with their families than read, my mother said, tightening her lips. Her words stung. Now that the other new children are here, it is time for us to take you to the school, my father said, coming up behind us. Go and gather your things. My parents led me along the same street I had run down to lose my sisters and cousins the day before. The buildings came into view. The garden was deserted now. Are they both schools? I asked my father. No, only that one. He pointed at the building on the right. The other is the hospital where you will be trained when you are old enough. You may be asked to help out there at times. Like a nurse? That sounds fun. My father gave me a look that said he did not think so. The top floor is where the students sleep. The building is divided into a boy's side and a girl's side, and you will not be allowed to talk with the boys, even if they are your cousins. The school was beginning to look less inviting. I wondered how I would ever feel safe enough to sleep in such a large place. I was used to staring at the glowing coals from my father's pipe where I slept under his bed until I drifted off. It suddenly sank in. My family would not be staying with me. How would I fall asleep without the smoky red glow? The church is in the middle of the dorm rooms, and the classrooms and ref ref refractory are below them, he explained. What's a refractory? A place where many people eat together. My mother was silent. She did not say a word until my father had his hand on the big double doors of the school. It's not too late to change your mind, Illumin. Change my mind? I could manage. I would read myself to sleep like Rosie did. I wasn't going to let anything stop me. I couldn't wait to go inside. My father placed a hand on my shoulder. 
you will not be able to return home for a very long time. I know, I said, but I didn't. My eighth birthday had only just passed. I did not yet understand how long a year was. It had not crossed my mind that the same ice that allowed my people to travel only in the brief weeks of the summer would keep me from going home. I did not know that an unusually short summer in 1945 would hold me prisoner for a second year with the sisters and the fathers and the brothers. They were not family. They were like owls and ravens raising wrens. My father pulled open the door and I stepped past him. I was inside a school for the first time in my life. All around me was glass and wood. An enormous photograph hung on one of the clean painted walls. In it and outside I wore a fancy sash. Medallions like large coins hung from his chest. I would learn later that he was the king of all the outsiders. They told me he was also my king, but I knew that my family listened to no one but Mr. Carter and Mr. Wilkie who owned the North Star. The school smells were unfriendly and harsh against the tender skin of my inner nostrils. I craned my head in every possible direction I could without moving my feet. It was like someone had enlarged the Hudson's Bay Company by many times and stripped it clean. My eyes darted from wall to wall, trying to take it all in. An outsider with a hooked nose like a beak came for me. Her scraping footsteps echoed through the long, otherwise silent halls. I'm glad you have come to your senses, she told my father in a nouvelle ton. You certainly can't teach her the things she needs to know. She wrapped her, a dark cloaked arm around my shoulder and ushered me away without giving me a chance to say goodbye. I looked back and saw my father wiping tears from my mother's face. I wanted to run to her and tell her that it would be all right, but a priest approached them right then and they walked away with him. <laughs>